Today we're going to take a look at 27 gene editing stocks. It may seem like a large number, and it is, but we're going to go through this in a similar fashion to how hiring managers vet candidates. So we're going to exclude anything that we clearly wouldn't invest in, and then the remaining companies, of which there will be five, we'll then scrutinize further in a different presentation. So today it's all about finding a population of gene editing stocks and vetting it. So the thesis doesn't require much introduction. The single most powerful technology known to man is nature. So if you are somebody who's ever grown a garden or is familiar with how vegetables are, or fruit are grown, then you understand just how powerful nature is. So you can plant a seed and then give it some water and some nutrients and sunlight and pretty soon you have food. So if we can harness nature, there's a lot we can do. And synthetic biology is pretty much humans harnessing nature. And it's probably the single most exciting thesis that we cover. And a key component of synthetic biology is the ability to alter the recipe of life, DNA. So if you can change DNA, then you can start to create new things that aren't even found in nature. Essentially, you can harness the most efficient method of production known to mankind. So we want to have some exposure to synthetic biology, and so far that hasn't worked out so well, but one pick and shovel play would be gene editing, and that's what we're gonna look at today. So in order to come up with a population of stocks, we always like to find other people that have done the heavy lifting, and there's a new ETF firm out there called Kelly ETFs, and they put together this CRISPR and gene editing technology ETF. It's the only ETF that we're familiar with that provides pure play exposure to gene editing, and we've pulled up a couple metrics here. So it's relatively new. You can see it came out at the beginning of this year. Consequently, it has very low net assets of under a million dollars. And perhaps they haven't updated this, but that's a very small amount of money for a new ETF. Typically, anything around the $20 million range or less will struggle, struggle to get traction because a lot of Institutional investors will take a look at the AUM and say, well, that's just too small, it becomes a chicken and the egg problem. So they need to definitely raise more assets, but we don't invest in ETFs, so it's kind of a non-issue. And if we did, we probably wouldn't invest in this ETF for reasons that we're gonna talk about shortly. Now, when we look at the expense ratio for a thematic ETF, considering they're doing the research themselves because they also provide the underlying index, that's above average in terms of expense, but uh, they've picked 23 stocks, and that's what we're gonna look at today. And here are the top 10. So in the top four positions, you see three of the first gene editing stocks that ever came out. So although you could argue Sangamo was the first or others, these would be the first real CRISPR gene editing startups that went public and that became ways to play gene editing. So you have CRISPR, Editas, and Intellia, and we also see, see Beam Therapeutics. Now, before we get into talking about these companies, we want to exclude anything on this list that we wouldn't consider to be a pure play, and there are a number. A good way to do that is simply by sorting them all by market cap. So you can see here, you have AbbVie, Novartis. Those are two of the top five pharmaceutical companies in the world. So that's hardly a pure play on gene editing, but what Kelly's done here is what other ETF providers do, and that is they add more stable companies to the mix for a number of reasons. One, they don't have that many constituents to choose from, so they need to add some variety in there. And two, these larger companies provide more stability to the ETF and make it more attractive to institutional investors. So we're not interested in investing in large pharmaceutical companies, otherwise we would do just that. We're interested in investing in pure play gene editing technology stocks. So these names that we've circled here, You've got Avi, Thermo Fishers, Life Sciences Equipment Provider, so is Agilent, and also Novartis. If we exclude those four names, here's the list that we get. So the top 10 adjusted. And 
we have some of the usual suspects, but I've highlighted two names in the middle there, Beam Therapeutics and Allergene. So these are different from the other names you see here because they're not using CRISPR. They're using different approaches to gene editing. So let's talk about that real quick. And we're not gonna get into the specifics about technologies, but I like to use this little table from MIT we've been using for many years now in some of our articles around gene editing. I will put some links to those, by the way, in the description of this video, because we've written extensively about gene editing over the years. Now, here are three ways in this table that you can edit genes. You have zinc finger, talons, and CRISPR. And then we've added a fourth, which is base editing. So on that previous slide here, the two companies in the middle, Beam uses base editing and Allergene uses Talons. Now, Talons is a less than superior way to conduct gene editing. So here's a statement from Beckman Coulter that says, unlike CRISPR, which can introduce multiple gene mutations concurrently with a single injection, Talons are limited to simple mutations. Well, both these approaches have problems, but Talon seems to be less efficient. And when you're talking about a technology that hasn't seen the same adoption that CRISPR has, it really isn't worth spending much time on. So we added a couple names to this list that Kelly didn't have in their ETF. And those were Selectus, which the management team at Selectus kind of um, contributed to the development of Talon such that they've actually trademarked the name Talon, but they also had a spin-off called Calixt, which was supposed to apply Talon's gene editing to agriculture applications, and they don't seem to have been doing much considering that company now has a $13 million market cap. It's so small, it's about ready to disappear. Then you have Selectus, which is also quite a small company, and Allergene Therapeutics, $1.3 billion company, that's still sizable. They licensed Talon's technology from Selectus and they're trying to bring some drugs to market. They recently had, I think that was last year, the FDA froze their development work and then they resumed it and there was a, a meaningful drop in share price around that time, uh, which just goes to show how volatile all of these technologies are. But the point is that we're going to write off Talon's in favor of other more optimal methods of gene editing such as CRISPR. So when we look at the rest of the names in Kelly's ETF, on the left-hand side here, we've taken 13 more names. So that's 23 in total, right? They have 23 names in their ETF. Well, we've done a similar exercise. You can see all these large cap companies that they've introduced to the list. And rather than go through these, some of these should look familiar, Illumina, uh, we're, we're invested in them for other reasons than gene editing, though they will stand to benefit from that. But we've taken that list and we've eliminated anything with a market cap of $10 billion or more. These are all companies that have business in other areas not related to gene editing, though they may stand to benefit from the growth of gene editing. So we've taken the remainder of the names here. You can see on the right-hand side, the first of which is Twist Biosciences. Now, we've written about Twist uh, quite recently, looking at exactly what they do, and they will benefit from gene editing, but they're not a gene editing company. They're more a pick and shovel play on a number of different things, and you can read that article, but we wouldn't consider them to be a gene editing company. Now, the remainder of the names that you see here, these four names are all worth looking into. Now, the last three, we don't believe have gone anywhere. So the first two names there, Sangamo and Bluebird Bio. So these are the OGs of gene editing. Sangamo has been around for two decades. Bluebird has been around for three decades. And if you're a tech investor, you probably recall a time when Bluebird Bio was a commonly, come it was a name you would commonly come across because it was talked a lot about on Wall Street. Now, when you look at these recent headlines, for companies that have been around for decades, these are not the sorts of headlines that you want to see. Sangamo uses zinc finger. And you see here, Sanofi tears up Sangamo cell therapy deal in pivot to off-the-shelf approaches. Whenever a big drug pharmaceutical company lets a drug developer go, that's not a good sign. And then you see the second headline here, 
Bluebird Bio has doubts about continuing to do business through 2022, announces CFO resignation. These are two firms that are under $500 million market cap that have been around for decades. We don't want to have anything to do with this. If synthetic biology taught us anything, it's that you don't invest in companies that have been spinning wheels for decades, trying to pivot their way into a success and burning through loads of cash in the process. So these two companies would be off our list. Now, the other two names here, one of these we've added that wasn't on Kelly's list, and that would be Homology Medicines. Again, these are two very small companies, $111 million and $100 million. They're drug developers that had some buzz because they had partnered with a reasonably sized partner. So you have Precision Biosciences, they had Arcus Gene Editing, and they were working with Gilead, and they pulled the plug. This was fairly recently. Now they're a $111 million company with $143 million in cash going at it alone. How far do you think a drug developer is going to get, a small drug developer like that, when capital is starting to dry up? Probably not very far. That's too risky, nothing we'd want to consider there. And then you have homology medicines. They had come up with their own method of gene editing that doesn't require a nucleus. Novartis was working with them around the time they had a $100 million IPO. Now they're a $100 million company with $155 million in cash and dry powder, and they're going at it alone. I believe that one of these two firms still has a decent-sized partner. But again, when you have a big pharmaceutical company come in and partner up and then say, well, you know, see you later, that's not a very good sign. And certainly other large drug developers aren't going to be too keen to go and um, take somebody's sloppy seconds there. So these are not two firms that we would consider investing in. Now, this other name, Verve Therapeutics, quite interesting. They were uh, coming out of Google. So Google's bio... Um, bio capital ventures investment arm there that Verily was a part of and whatnot. They funded Verve and Verve's doing some very interesting stuff. So they're pioneering the single course gene editing medicine for cardiovascular disease. You think about older people take Lipitor for their cholesterol. Just think about how many people you know that take cholesterol drugs. Well, this would be a one and done gene editing treatment for heart disease and what they're using, along with a number of other technologies you can see here, what they're using is base editing. And that's a new type of gene editing that Verve is using, which they've licensed from a company called Beam Therapeutics. Now, we had written about Beam around the time of their IPO. That was several years ago. And we've always been eyeballing them and they've been in the back of our mind as a potential superior gene editing technique. So if you look at, and I'll include this article that we wrote and I took a couple excerpts from that, in that we were wondering if perhaps CRISPR was uh, beta and Beam and their base editing was VHS and that may very well be the case. But base editing focuses on precision gene editing which replaces single letters without inducing a double strand dna break so uh this gentleman from exconomy has a good analogy here he says if we misspelled a single letter in a word base editing would allow us to change the letter while crispr would only allow us to change the entire word well according to beam therapeutics their technology eliminates a lot of the problems and limitations that all the other methods of gene editing that we've talked about, including CRISPR, they limit or they uh, reduce completely all those problems. So they say, if existing gene editing approaches are scissors for the genome, our base editors are pencils erasing and rewriting one letter in the gene. So it certainly seems like a very exciting technology. And to learn more about this, we spent some time talking with Tommy over at CRISPR Talk. Now, throughout this video, we're not going to get into the technical details of gene editing. You can study that on your own, and it's not something we want to dabble in because we don't have that background. So we spent some time talking to Tommy. He's kind enough to spend a great deal of time explaining these things to us, and he happens to be very bullish on beam therapeutics and citing a lot of the reasons that their technology may be at the forefront of these various types of technology. So some of the things that he's mentioned here is that, you know, we would have concerns, I guess, firstly, 
around IP. So when we invested in gene editing, we took a spray and pray approach. We picked the first three companies that came out that were the leaders, right? CRISPR, Intellia, and Editas. And we said, hopefully one of them will succeed. And at that time, we had a lot of concerns around the IP. Well, Tommy assures us, based on his research, that their IP portfolio is wrapped up tight. Well, how do you tell? Well, the fact that they're licensing it to so many other companies is a very good indicator. So we'll definitely look to do a follow-up on Beam Therapeutics and dig deeper into whether or not that's a company that we think we should hold in our portfolio. It certainly sounds like it is one. Um, so the technology that they have is sufficient, and that was a concern we've always had. All right, there's going to be a new technology around the corner. So when does that stop? There's constantly a new technology coming out. So there's not just base editing. David Liu brought us base editing. He's a notable um, pioneer in gene editing, and now he's developed prime editing, and they've actually partnered up with Beam Therapeutics, which is quite interesting, and that's something that we look at covering in a future article. But uh, some criticisms of Beam is, would be that they're progressing more slowly than some would hope on the commercial side. And uh, from what I can tell, Tommy's quite critical about the company and uh, stirs up the pot quite a bit. So if you would like to follow gene editing more closely, certainly go over and subscribe to CRISPR Talk because Tommy does a great job of describing what's going on in the domain and he follows it very closely. So just to conclude this video, We've gone from 27 gene editing stocks now to a handful, five. We've got four CRISPR names and Beam Therapeutics. So when we're looking at these firms, we've invested in three of them based on that spray and pray approach, but we want to revisit that and say, all right, which firms should we be invested in based on all the information that we have to date? And there's a couple things to note here. So somebody correctly pointed out recently that we've broken our rules by investing in pre-revenue companies. So some of these firms do have revenues, but for all practical purposes, these are drug developers. We don't invest in drug developers. Why? Too many unknowns, too many regulatory unknowns. Drug developers are extremely risky, but gene editing is so compelling and we find synthetic biology to be such a powerful thesis that we want some skin in the game. So we invested in these firms when they had, around the time they had their IPOs, CRISPR, Intellia, and Editas. And when this would have been, I think, late 2020, there was a rapid rise in gene editing stocks. We wrote an article at that time, I'll put it in the description. And these stocks just soared around some news. And I can't recall what that was, but when you have a collection of stocks that soars like that, that's because of the market and hype. So while we don't like to participate in market timing, we trimmed our positions and we trimmed them because the rise was so high with these stocks, we trimmed enough to recoup our entire cost basis. So we're actually playing with the house's money. Now you have to be careful about the house money effect, but that's a good thing since we've recouped our money. Now we want to say, all right, where should that money be placed? Are we holding the right three stocks? The answer is probably no. What looks interesting here would be to hold some exposure to CRISPR and to have some exposure to base editing. So that's something we're going to explore in a future video. Please go ahead and put your comments in the comment section. Make sure to subscribe to our channel. Make sure to subscribe to Tommy's channel to uh, keep up to speed on what's going on in the gene editing world. And thank you very much for taking the time to watch this video today.